Welcome everyone. My name is Pamela Buttery and I'm an instructor for IRP Canada. It is my pleasure today to introduce Pat Lewis, the director of IRP Canada, an affiliate of the International Institute for Restorative Practices Graduate School. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a bit of background about Pat Lewis, our director. She um, has a Bachelor of Education from Queen's University and a Master's in Leadership and Administration from Brock University. Pat was a principal in a large urban school board and, and Pat has presented at many international conferences. She has worked with communities to transform uh, relationships and communities in international settings. And um, thank you so much, Pat, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and expertise. Personally, before we start, I would like to give you an appreciation. I would like to say that I really um, enjoy working with you for the past four years. And I really um, am thankful for all the mentorship and support that you've given me. So if it's okay, I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about IRP Canada, the organization, and um, maybe we can talk about some future directions. Thank you, Pam, for that warm introduction. I too have enjoyed working with you and all of the, uh, the team of instructors at IRP over the last number of years, um, and feel like I've been mentored by you as well. Okay, well, we'll begin with our first question, which is uh, about the uh, context of restorative practice. And for those people that maybe aren't as familiar um, with the field and, and with the concept of restorative practices, um, what do you, what is happening in the field today and, and how would you describe restorative practices? Um, restorative practices is often described as the science of relationship and community. And while I think that that's a really accurate uh, description, I, uh, generally it might be too broad for people to understand what our practice is actually about for those that might be new to this field. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'd just like to talk about it in terms of I think three general um, areas that restorative practices um, works in. Um, the field continues to be about promoting um, processes that nurture healthy relationships and connection. Um, the listening circles that we've been sharing quite widely over these past uh, number of very difficult months demonstrates how the simple exercise of sharing our stories and hearing the experiences of others can impact our personal well-being and forge connections, human to human connections. So listening circles is just one of the proactive strategies under that umbrella of restorative practices that are geared toward and, and um, are geared toward promoting the development of healthy relationships between people in community and school communities and other communities. I also believe that part of our work in restorative practices is creating more just and equitable environments. Uh, and I think if this is applied to um, schools and community organizations and neighborhoods and a whole range of places where people come together in community. By promoting and elevating all stakeholder voices um, and by adhering to fair process, I think the restorative processes allow for um, more equity and more equity and um, more uh, a more just kind of um, situation or community. And then the third, um, is that um, restorative practices is about processes that repair harm and that transform conflict in a way that is very relational in that it sustains relationships through the conflict resolution process. So I would say those three things, um, the building healthy relationships, creating just and equitable environments and repairing harm are the three components of restorative practices. Great, thank you. Um, as you know, um, we've all been um, affected by COVID in different ways internationally across the globe. And I'm wondering um, how has IRP Canada um, responded to that um, in terms of um, what have they offered and, and what are you thinking about in relation to um, this, this difficult time? Thanks, Pam. 
I think um, similar to all communities and organizations, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit organizations, whether they're community groups, um, we have been affected by um, what we've experienced uh, collectively in this pandemic. And so IRP is, is really no different than any other organization or, or group of people. Um, a couple of our responses, I think, that um, are worth noting. Um, one of them would be that we pivoted very quickly to online learning, to a virtual learning platform. So most of, if not at this point, all of the trainings that we used to deliver in person are now available for people to take in an online learning environment. Um, I'm quite proud of uh, the quality of the learning programs that we've been that we've developed for this virtual classroom. I think the organization has had a lot of experience working virtually through our faculty through our graduate school, um, because we have international faculty and students in the graduate school. That experience has always been has always had a significant online portion. So we harnessed the expertise that had been developed by um, our instructors in the graduate school and applied what we know to be good pedagogy when we're bringing people together um, and, and leveraging and, and hoping to leverage their experiences and their expertise um, to create these engaging um, training programs, training sessions online. A second thing that, that um, IRP did almost from the beginning, I would say early on in the pandemic um, and when we were all under lockdown, um, IRP recognized that people were experiencing this collective traumatic experience. You know, our lives were, our livelihood in some cases and our lives were disrupted by um, the pandemic and by uh, local and, um, and federal responses. Um, so to, to um, help uh, people, IRP introduced listening circles uh, and offered them very widely um, to, um, to the public. So initially, um, the trauma that we were uh, helping to, um, helping people to process was just a response to COVID and what their experience was like. Uh, listening circle provides that structure where people can come together and tell their stories and listen to other stories. No solution, you're not, you're not problem solving, you're not coming up with solutions, you're just coming together to talk. And then later on, um, in response to the killing of George Floyd and the racial tension that was um, sort of uh, revealed, I think, I don't think that sparked it specifically, but I think a lot of um, racial tension, uh, institutional racism, a lot of concerns, public concerns about, about racism were um, revealed. Um, after that, um, we brought people together to talk about racism, both in Canada and the United States. We held public listening circles. We did private listening circles to give people an opportunity to speak about their experiences uh, and their responses um, and to just listen to each other. So in those two, those are two of the responses that IRP has had to uh, specifically to the uh, pandemic, to COVID-19 and, and, and what we've you know, what we've been experiencing in the last nine months. Great, thank you. I, I know that you've, you've done a lot of work um, with the team and I know in a matter of a week or so, we're heading into a new year, uh, 2021. And I know lots of people are, are happy to see the end of 2020. And I think there's some more um, hope and optimism now because the vaccines have, um, been created and delivered and so um, in that regard looking toward towards future directions for IRP Canada I'm wondering if you could share some things that you're thinking about. For sure thanks Pam. The um, I think a, a, a key um, concept in any restorative process is that you're bringing together people who have been most impacted uh, by an incident or most impacted by something that's something that's happening. And you're bringing them together to give voice to their stories and their concerns, bringing them together because they've been most impacted, they're in the best position to make decisions about how the situation could be resolved or how the repair could be, um, how the what the repair could be. When I think about our work in schools, 
uh, we've done a lot of work with teachers, helping teachers develop restorative processes. Um, but we haven't necessarily done work or provided support for other stakeholders in a school setting. So one of the things that we're working on as a, as a team is developing um, a student uh, training program to help students um, develop the skills and understand the processes that are so key to uh, bringing people together and problem solving together and hearing each other's stories. Um, so that's something that we're going to be um, launching in the in upcoming months that I'm really excited about. Um, I think uh, I mentioned early on about that uh, one of the powers of restorative practices is to give voice um, to voices that we sometimes don't hear. And I think in school settings, um, giving voice to students and empowering them to run these processes themselves um, will be a really powerful uh, force in the implementation or the creation or the transformation of schools into restorative uh, communities. Um, also moving forward, we're giving a lot of thought to um, how do we measure success in school settings? You know, how do we help schools to be able to set, step back and assess um, their implementation of restorative practices? So we continue to do that work and develop supports um, for, that to, um, for that to take place. And something interesting that, um, that I've noticed over the last few months um, is the conversations with people in other organizations outside of schools and the interest in finding ways to bring uh, people together to um, highlight or leverage you know, the voices of all stakeholders. So I believe that these practices are of interest to not just traditionally our traditional clients in schools or traditionally we've worked closely with um, community justice organizations, but I think in the private sector and larger public institutions, there's a need for and an interest in how to build relationships in community. It's so interesting that the pandemic, I think, although it's kept us further apart physically, it has shone a light on the, the need that we have as human beings to connect with one another and to forge, you know, to support each other in community. Um, so I think that that's probably what's behind um, the conversations and the questions that I've been having from other organizations about how can we foster and nurture that in our, in our work community. Great, thanks. Thank you. It sounds like a lot of exciting um, things happening in the field. And in terms of connections, I'm wondering if you could share with people how they can connect with you, get more information about training or upcoming events um, or just the organization in general. Sure, we, we love you to connect with us. One of the, one of the reasons why we are doing this um, conversation or filming this conversation today is that we are um, relaunching uh, our website. Um, so hopefully you're watching this on the website. And on that website, you'll find lots of information about the kinds of training programs or not training programs, but the kinds of training and supports that we offer for um, public and private institutions. And you'll also find contact information for myself there. So my phone number and my email address are available and you can contact me directly with any questions you have. We can arrange for a Zoom meeting, <laughs> which is about as close to in-person meetings that we've uh, we've been able to manage. But um, we'd love to meet you and uh, talk with you about your goals and aspirations and how we can support you in reaching those. Thank you, Pat. I think that's it for today. And uh, thank you.